and we'll get the remediated clean water after the nutrient removal, nutrient recovery, and the treated water can be again used for the microalgae cultivation. So this is a schematic of the present uh, scenario of the wastewater treatment of microalgae with concomitant CO2 sequestration, mainly CO2, which is emitted by the power plants and other industries, and wastewater generated from the dairy industry, uh, agro industry, and other uh, textile industry can be used for the cultivation of microalgae in uh, reactors, and then the algal culture processing, algal harvesting, then biomass to biofuel has to be extracted. And after the biofuel extraction, the fuel extracted biomass will be subjected to some bio-based products like biofertilizer, biopesticides, and aquacultural feed production. So these are some of the microalgal strains which are reported in literature, which grows in mainly urine wastewater, municipal wastewater, piggery wastewater, soybean wastewater, dairy wastewater, with their biomass productivity and cultivation period. And some of the, uh, this suspended wastewater treatment system is the conventional technique used for so many long years to treat the wastewater using microalgae. But the microalgal tar scrubber for wastewater treatment is the new technique uh, which is an engineered structure where wastewater is poured over the naturally embedded filamentous microalgae that acts like a tarp. Microalgae treats wastewater by taking the inorganic compounds from the wastewater and release dissolved oxygen through photosynthesis, as we all know that microalgae is a photosynthetic organism. And the nutrients, those have not been taken up or scrubbed by the microalgae, remains in the microalgal biomass in the form of tar. And, the, and this technique is reported as one of the highest biomass producing technique and wastewater remediation technique in the literature till date. And another system is that immobilized wastewater treatment, which is mainly done in the closed photobioreactor. So there is some drawbacks to cultivate microalgae in open respite ponds, because in the climatic condition like India, the, in summer days, the temperature rises up to, in some parts of India, the temperature rises up to 45, 50. So some of the microalgae can't tolerate that much of temperature for their growth. And also with the cultivation of microalgae, uh, there is some bacterial contamination if we cultivate the microalgae in open respite bones. So photobioreactor cultivation or the close cultivation of microalgae is much more preferable than the open respite bonds. These are some of the photobioreactor used for the um, cultivation of microalgae with wastewater and also with the CO2 sequestration capacity. This is the air lift reactor, helical reactor, flat panel rocking reactor. This is mainly used for biohydrogen production. This is an engineered photobioreactor where we can continuously monitor the dissolved oxygen, pH and temperature of the system. And this is a bubble column reactor with orifice budget. This is normal air flat panel reactor. This is bubble column reactor ring budget. And this is a very uh, new uh, reactor. This is mainly the second installation in IIT Kharagpur in the whole world. That is the internal LED light illuminated control reactor because for all of this system, the light is given externally. But in this system, the light is internally illuminated to uh, distribute the light uh, uniformly inside the photobioreactor for the proper growth of microalgae and also this is controlled. And mainly for the industrial purpose, till date the bubble column and air lift reactors are mainly used for the large scale cultivation of microalgae. So cultivation part uh, is important for microalgae, but the biodiesel, it, if it has to compete with the conventional diesel, so it has to compete economically with the conventional diesel. So the 90% cost of the biodiesel production accounts to the biodiesel production process, the processing step and the biomass drying step before the biodiesel extraction. So development of a suitable transesterification technique is after the, uh, means the intracellular lipid has to be extracted and it has to be converted into bio biodiesel. So that step has to be trans that step has to be optimized 
and the life cycle assessment of the overall process has to be done to find out the environmental impacts of the overall process to be commercially available in the market and to uh, uh, scale up in the industry level. So this work was published in Energy Conversion and Management Journal. So what is biodiesel from microalgae? Biodiesel are the monoalkyl esters of long chain fatty acids produced by transesterification reaction, triglycerides with the help of methanol and some catalysts produce glycerol and methyl ester. Methyl esters are the biodiesel. And what are the advantages of using biodiesel? Because biodiesel reduces emission of carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, and SOx in the atmosphere. It has higher Cetan index. It has higher flash points, so it is safe to use. And it requires no automobile engine modification to use that biodiesel in the existing uh, engines. So mainly for the transesterification process, uh, acid and base catalysts are used conventionally. So acid and base catalysts both have some drawbacks because acid catalyst can corrode the reactor wall if you do the in-situ transesterification process. And it is also not reusable and it has some toxic effect. The base catalyst has the saponification reaction with the free fatty acids. So the yield is very less for using the base catalyst and it is also not reusable. But the nano catalysts are sustainable and it is reusable. Also the nano catalyst has higher catalytic activity large specific surface area and high resistance to saponification. So uh, the present out work outline is the first uh, cultivation of microalgae here, Neochloris oleogondans QTX 1185 was used. As I previously told that this algal strain is very much rich in lipid content and uh, is cultivated in the dairy wastewater and this temperature, pH, light intensity and photobioreactor was already previously uh, optimized and which was already published in another journals. So these are the optimized parameters. And after that, conversion of the biodiesel from the lipid of neochloris oleogundans. And mainly uh, in the conventional process, the microalgal biomass has to be dried for so long hours. Near about it takes 24 to 48 hours to dry the microalgal biomass in hot air oven or uh, other uh, furnace or something. But uh, here to reduce the cost of the production, the directly autoflocculated wet biomass was used for the lipid extraction process. Then the uh, Fe2O3 nanocatalyst uh, was used in the transesterification process. This catalyst here was newly synthesized. And the transesterification process parameter optimization was there and comparison of the two biodiesel extraction process bioethanol and biohydrogen production from the lipid extracted biomass and life cycle assessment and aspen plus analysis. So first, in the first step, the algae was cultivated in a bubble column reactor with ring spurger, total volume of two liter, and the medium was uh, dairy based water and inoculation volume is 7% PYB, initial pH is seven, cultivation temperature is 25. Uh, 25. So uh, these two articles uh, already, I told that the optimized things, these are the optimized things which was reported in these two literature. And in this process, the cultivation, uh, the medium is was used as a dairy wastewater and also the CO2 was being sequestered in the cultivation process. So uh, both CO2 sequestration and wastewater is there. And after the cultivation, we achieved that 2.5% uh, BYB CO2 air mixture was optimized for the cultivation and biomass concentration of 2.56 gram per liter was achieved with the lipid content of 49% weight by weight with the lipid concentration of 1.25 gram per liter. After the cultivation of microalgae in that photobioreactor coupled with the wastewater uh, treatment and also with the CO2 sequestration, the microalgal biomass was harvested by autoflocculation technique. This is a very simple technique by varying the pH so here the pH was considered 8 to 14 and we achieved maximum flocculation efficiency at pH 13 within 30 minutes of time, that is 94.51%. We can see that flock formation was there under uh, this uh, beaker and zeta potential changed from 16.4 millivolt to minus 2.13 millivolt. As the zeta potential tends to zero value, 
So flock formation and agglomeration occurs for the microalgal cells due to van der Waal interaction forces. So after the harvesting, the supernatant were discarded and the wet biomass was taken and uh, microalgal lipid is intracellular in nature. So, and the microalgal cell wall is very rigid. So we have to give some pre-treatment on the wet microalgal biomass to extract the intracellular lipid completely from the microalgal cells. So three different types of uh, pre-treatment were given. That is ultrasonication, autoclaving, and microwave irradiation. And we can see from the uh, same image that for the autoclave pretreatment technique, the cell, all the microalgal cells got disrupted, which means the lipid is lipid comes out from the microalgal cell. And after the lipid content analysis, it was found out that 56.5% weight by weight lipid was extracted from the autoclave pre-treated wet microalgal biomass, which is comparably high than the other pre-treatment process. Then, uh, as we all know that uh, in the present research, uh, the attention has been shifted towards the use of nanocatalyst in the transesterification process, and mostly metal nanocatalysts were used, but the most of the metal nanocatalysts are used uh, with the uh, chemical synthesis. And these chemicals have some uh, shape forming and reducing elements on that. And they also have some toxic properties. So we have to find out a greener way to produce this nanocatalyst to make the process much more sustainable. So he, uh, in the literature, it was reported that hibiscus rosa sinensis, a very common plant, uh, the leaf of that plant is capable enough to produce platinum zinc nanoparticles. So as per the best of our knowledge, this is the first report to produce iron oxide nanoparticle from the leaf extract of hibiscus rosa sinensis plant. Iron oxide particle was uh, synthesized and calcined at 700 degrees centigrade for two hours. Then uh, to find out the characteristics and match with the characteristics with the properties of iron oxide, it was reconfirmed with the XRT pattern and also size of the nanoparticle was observed uh, by the FECM and TAME image. And it was revealed that XRT pattern shows sharp diffraction features indexed to the rhombohedral alpha fe 3 phase. And the FECM image uh, show agglomerated particle of size in the range of 150 to 200 nanometer and TAME image also show, showed the same image. So, it confirmed the successful synthesis of the hibiscus rosa sinensis plant extracted nanocatalyst. And then the newly synthesized nanocatalyst was used in the transesterification process and it was compared with the other conventional catalyst used in the transesterification process. And it was observed that 81% uh, biodiesel was obtained using fe 2 3 nanoparticle which is much more higher than the HCL and NOH in the transesterification process. So after that, uh, successful synthesis of the nanocatalyst and the preliminary study, we have to optimize the transesterification process parameter using this fe 2 3 nanocatalyst. So first we have to optimize the concentration of the nanocatalyst in the solvent mixture used to uh, use for the transesterification reaction. So the nanocatalyst concentration varied in the range of one to 5% uh, were considered. And it was found out that for the case of 1% weight by weight nanocatalyst concentration, the fame content that is biodiesel yield is 83%. And the reaction temperature uh, varied from 35 to 75 degrees Celsius were uh, considered for the study. And it was found out that for the case of 65 degrees centigrade temperature, the uh, biodiesel yield is maximum, that is 84.2% weight by weight. Uh, because uh, maybe due to the high temperature, uh, the viscosity of the biodiesel is uh, less. So the much more amount of lipid comes into the contact with the methanolic catalyst solution for the production of biodiesel. And the reaction time is much more lower than the conventional process. Usually it is reported that for the production of biodiesel, 
uh, for by using HCL and anyone you to request seven hours, eight hours, it was already reported. But for this case, we achieved uh, the biodiesel within four hours of reaction time with the 85% of yield. Then after uh, extraction and transesterification process parameter optimization, we have to find out the characteristics of the fatty acid methyl esters, which was extracted in the form of biodiesel. So for that, gas chromatographic flame ionization detector analysis was done. And it was found out that uh, C16 to C18 is the major contributing element present on that flame or biodiesel, which is very much suitable for the biodiesel to be used as the uh, means as compared to conventional diesel and also the unsaturated fatty acid concentration is high. This is high for H2O3 nanocatalyst production than the normal conventional process and also this presence of saturated fatty acid at certain amount gives the oxidative stability of the biodiesel. Then after that, the fuel properties means is it usable in the engine or it requires any uh, engine modification or it requires any blend, blend to use that biodiesel. So, so for that, fuel properties were analyzed like kinematic viscosity, density, calorific value, acid value, iodine value, class point, four point, certain number. So we can see from the table that the biodiesel properties are very much similar to the conventional diesel and ASTM standard. So the uh, use of biodiesel can be feasible in the uh, automobile engine or in uh, diesel uh, driven engine. Then uh, to find out the industrial feasibility of the process, the Aspen Plus process simulation were carried out with the experimental data as a input value. So the simulation results give the biodiesel yield as 90, 90%, which is the maximum deviation 3.5% from the experimental results of biodiesel yield was obtained, which is a very quite good match with the experimental results. So this process can be used in the industry in large scale basis. Then after that, the life cycle assessment of the biodiesel production process was carried out using the Gabi 7 software. So why we will do the life cycle assessment? No process is complete and ready for industry if we don't analyze the environmental impacts of the process. So in the life cycle assessment study, first we have to find out the goal and scope definition. Means what is the goal and scope of the process? Then the inventory analysis, and then the impact assessment, and then the interpretation of the data. So here we took uh, some parameters for the life cycle assessment. There, there is a global warming potential, eutrophication potential, human toxicity potential, and ozone depletion potential of the environment. And the comparison between the conventional process using the HCL as catalyst and Fe2O3 as a catalyst were used. And it was found out from the analysis that 6.55% decrease of kg CO2 equivalent observed during the Fe2O3 nanocatalyst use. 16.81% decrease in phosphate equivalent was observed using Fe2O3 nanocatalyst. 6.21% decrease in phosphate equivalent was observed using Fe2O3 nanocatalyst. And 6.13% uh, decrease of R11 equivalent observed using the Fe2O3 nanocatalyst with respect to HCL. Then after biodiesel production process and life cycle assessment study, the defatted microalgal biomass was subjected to analyze for the carbohydrate content. We have to find out means what are the carbohydrate content remaining in the defatted microalgal biomass. So we observed that 20.2% weight by weight carbohydrate is still present on that defatted microalgal biomass. So that carbohydrate was subjected for dark fermentation and fermentation process for production of biohydrogen and ethanol production using the acidogenic mixed consortia and ethanol production by Saccharomyces cerevisiae, co-culture mainly for the biohydrogen production, dark fermentation process was adopted and for the Saccharomyces cerevisiae ethanol production, the normal fermentation process and it was done in lab scale in serum bottle. And we found out that bioethanol production of 0.612 gram per liter 
was achieved and biohydrogen production of 485 ml per liter was achieved which this biorefinery approach uh, again uh, increases the sustainability of the overall process because we have to reduce the cost of the biodiesel production and also the sustainability of the process if we get three types of fuel from one microalgal biomass and also the microalgal drying process can be reduced then uh, the cost will again reduce for the biodiesel production process so summarizing the work microalgal cultivation in wastewater with concomitant co2 sequestration is there so uh, CO2 sequestration and biofuel production from neochloric solubent and CUGX1185. Autoclave pre treatment of wet microalgal biomass showed higher efficiency for lipid extraction. FE2O3 catalyst synthesized from hibiscus rosa sinensis can be a possible alternative for efficient process stratification process. Biodiesel properties shows a very good match with the ASTM standard and conventional diesel. LCA study indicates the biodiesel production of FE2O3 nanocatalyst is not only the sustainable but also superior of same for biodiesel production. Aspen Plus process simulation shows excellent agreement with the maximum deviation of 4.65% as certain the Aspen Plus simulation reliability and biohydrogen bioethanol production from the oil algal biomass can be integrated with biodiesel production process. This is the group at IIT Kharagpur which I work with, Bioprocess Engineering Lab and multi-phase computational free dynamics lab in chemical engineering department. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your, uh, uh, thank you for your speech. And uh, now as we have the interactive session, so we have received some questions from our participants. And uh, yes. uh, so the first question came from ma'am that is microalgae grown in coal regions contribute better biodiesel production? Uh, uh, means uh, we grow the microalgae in a lower uh, temperature also, that is 15 degree or 20 degree. 20 degree seven means in European climatic condition, the microalgal outdoor cultivation is much more favorable. And if we grow that in uh, outdoor cultivation, the reactor scale is much more higher than the closed photoreactor system. So the climatic condition is much more favorable in uh, European countries. Okay. So the second question is, uh, what are the correct ratio of saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids for best biodiesel production? Actually, uh, theoretically, it is 70 to 30, means unsaturated fatty acid should be 70 and uh, saturated fatty acid will be 30. It is the best theoretical yield reported in the literature. But uh, 75, 25, uh, 77, 20, up to 20, it is okay. Okay. And the uh, last question is, uh, to extract oil, if we have to subject to autoclaving and algal cells have to be destroyed, then yeah. the culture will be lost. Any other non-destructive method possible to extract algal oils? Uh, can you please repeat that question again? Uh, sure, ma'am. To extract oil, if we have to subject to autoclaving and algal cells have to be destroyed, then yeah. the culture will be lost. Yeah. Any other non-destructive method possible to extract algal oils? Uh, yeah, uh, there is some technique. Enzymatic disruption is also there, but mostly the enzymes are very costly. So we have to find out a cost-effective way. Means the nan uh, means in present day, some research was also conducting. In fact, my future uh, work is on that only. Uh, means by using nano catalyst without disrupting the culture, uh, can the oil be extracted or not? Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your valuable words. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So we are ready with our next speaker. Dr. Arindam Koyla is uh, our next speaker for this afternoon session. He is currently working as assistant professor at Department of Bioscience and Biotechnology, Vanasthali Vidyapeet University, Rajasthan. Previously, he worked as a research associate at Hindustan Petroleum Green R&D Sector, Bangalore. 
He did his PhD from Agricultural and Food Engineering Department, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, in 2013, in the area of lignocellulosic biofuel production. His major areas of research are enzyme technology, bioprocess development for biofuel production, and biopolymer production from lignocellulosic biomass. He has won Indo-Brazil collaborative project funded by DBT, New Delhi. He has guided two PhD students and currently four PhD students are working under his guidance. He has published six edited books, eight book chapters, 27 papers in peer reviewed journals and filled five patents. He is currently working, acting as a guest editor for the journal of food process engineering. So without wasting any time, I welcome Dr. Dr. Kulia, sir, please over to you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Can I start? Yes, sir, please. Yeah. My today talk is on current technological status and future prospect of lignocellulogic bioethanol production. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. So next slide, please. I did uh, PhD from IIT Kharagpur in 2013. After that, I worked as a research associate at Hindustan Petroleum R&D Center. Further uh, from that Hindustan Petroleum R&D Center, I uh, started working as an assistant professor here at Banasthali Vidyapit. Next slide. I published uh, five, uh, six edited books. I have 27 research uh, and review papers. I have uh, already two PhD students awarded under my guidance. And also I have um, one uh, Indo-Brazil collaborative project. Next slide. My area of research is first is uh, enzyme technology, that is improvement of cellulose, xylanase, and lipase production. Second is bioprocess development for lignocellulogic, bioethanol, and biodiesel production. Third is different valuable, valuable product development, such as biopolymer production using lignocellulogic biomass. Next slide. Today, my talk is only focused on lignocellulogic bioethanol production. Now, why lignocellulogic biofuel or bioethanol? Because there is need for alternative fuel. Nowadays, transportation is fast growing energy consuming sector. And it causes increased oil price and as well as global warming. So we need to uh, think for alternative fuel. Next, please. Next slide. There are several types of alternative fuels such as bioethanol, biodiesel. Previous slide, please. Previous. Yeah, bioethanol, biodiesel, biomethane, biohydrogen, and bioelectricity. Next. Next slide. Uh, bioethanol has several advantages over other biofuel, such as it has high energy density, reduced CO2 emission improved combustion, improved octane rating. Next slide. Next, next slide. Presently, bioethanol mainly produced from food sources such as sugarcane, cassava, sweet sorghum, corn, and wheat. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Now, if we produce bioethanol from these food sources, there are several issues will come. Major issue is fuel versus food it causes diversion of agricultural production away from food crop, as well as it causes food shortage and increased price of food. So we need to think for some other sources which can be useful for biofuel, bioethanol production and does not compete with our food chain. Next slide. So bioethanol from lignocellulogic biomass has the greater potential and it can be easily available so it can not also compete with our food chain. So lignocellulogic biomass can be useful for bioethanol production. Next slide. Next slide. So there are several type of lignocellulogic biomass are available in India, such as some food waste, potato peel, sugar cane vagas, cabbage waste, and some several agricultural waste, oil seed, rice straw, etc. Although food waste contain very low amount of carbohydrate, but several other non-food waste contain high amount of carbohydrates. Next slide, please. 
several non grazing waste also are there such as lantana camera bamboo is a bamboos water hyacinth these contain high amount of carbohydrates but along with this carbohydrates this contain significant amount of lignin next slide these are the overall distribution of biomass in different part of the india mainly rice straw cotton straw wheat straw uh, wheat straw and sugarcane bagas are used for bio uh, ethanol production and these are uh, distributed throughout the different state of india next slide lignocellular biomass mainly composed of lignin cellulose and hemicellulose lignin is polymer of phenolic units cellulose is polymer of glucose hemicellulose is polymer of pentose and hexose sugar so three units join together and these three component together uh, near, uh, together remain about 80 to 85 percent of the total weight next slide please so this is the overall process flow chart for lignocellulosic bioma biomass to bioethanol production first is delignification where lig where lignin is getting degraded further delignified biomass getting hydrolyzed with the help of cellulose and hemicellulose enzyme to produce pentose and hexose sugar further these free sugars are getting fermented to ethanol with the help of different pentose and hexose fermenting strain after the bioethanol production it it needs purification and concentrate uh, and it needs concentration so that purified and concentrated ethanol can be useful for fuel purpose next next slide yeah there are several technical challenges associated with lignocellulosic bioethanol production first is there needs proper understanding of the feed stocks second is development of cost effective pre treatment technology third is cost reduction for the enzy uh, cellulose enzyme as well as co fermentation of glucose and xylose next next slide for pre treatment purpose there are three type of pre treatment are available physical chemical and biological next slide yeah this is the some study carried out in our laboratory this is the lignocellulosic biomass before pre treatment and after pre treatment this is the biomass before this uh, here the pre treatment was carried out by dilute alkaline pre treatment after the pre treatment the cell wall cell wall structure was distorted due to degradation of lignin next slide next is lignocellulosic saccharification process lignocellulosic saccharification carry, can be carried out by chemical physical and biological method but nowadays mainly uh, saccharification process mainly carried out by enzymatic process due to its several advantages over other methods next slide so saccharification for saccharification the main enzymes responsible is cellulose and xylanes cellulose is composed of three component endo endoglucanase exoglucanase and beta glucosidase xylanes is also composed of endo beta xylanes so these two enzymes are mainly responsible for enzymatic saccharification process next slide next is ethanol fermentation it for ethanol fermentation the main yeast is saccharomyces cerevisiae it saccharomyces cerevisiae is mainly useful mainly useful for hexose sugar fermentation another yeast is pca stipetis it is mainly useful for pentose sugar fermentation there are several bacteria also you used for ethanol fermentation such as e coli klebsiella and gymomonas next is next slide so this is the work carried out in our laboratory hot water pre treatment on food waste here we can see that different pre treatment condition and ultimate reducing sugar production and lignin breakdown next slide this is the biomass uh without pre treatment and after pre treatment next slide ftr study also carried out uh, uh, there are was there was no stru structural distortion after pre treatment which uh, is beneficial for lignocellulosic saccharification next slide this is the same st study of the uh, pre treated food waste before pre treatment and after pre treatment after pre treatment the cell wall was distorted due to degradation of lignin next slide this is the excited study so you can see after pre treatment the crystallinity was increased 
the the increase in crystallinity was due to degradation of lignin uh, because um, lignin and hemicellulose are amorphous and cellulose is crystalline so in the total biomass if lignin amorphous portion is de uh, degraded that means total crystallinity getting increased that's why there was crystallinity index was increased next slide so this is the effect of temperature on reducing sugar production from food waste if you can you can see that at 50 degree centigrade maximum reducing sugar production was achieved next slide uh, this is the effect of incubation time you can see after 48 hour incubation time reducing sugar yield was maximum further there was no significant increase next slide then substrate concentration we also varied maximum uh, reduction sugar yield was achieved at 15% substrate concentration next slide yeah when we see that uh, effect of different surfactant they were not significantly affect to our uh, enzymatic saccharification process compared to control pro, uh, compared to without any uh, surfactant next slide so next ethanol fermentation was carried out by using different strain Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We isolated this strain, Saccharomyces. It uh, it produced 2.5 percent maximum ethanol, and Fusarium oxysporum was procured. It produced 1.7 percent. So Fusarium oxysporum was pentose uh, was pentose fermenting strain. Saccharomyces cerevisiae was hexose fermenting strain. So we co-culture both the strain. We achieved 3.25 percent maximum ethanol yield due to both the uh, due to the use of both the strain. Next slide. So this was uh, this work was carried out uh, previously. Uh, we isolated one strain that is Candida tropicalis. This strain was useful because this strain can produce cellulose enzyme, and in presence of furfural hydroxy fur methyl furfural and acetic acid. So th this same strain can be also useful for ethanol fermentation. So by using that same strain, we can be go for consolidated bioprocessing approach. Next slide. Now, uh, in this uh, in this publication, we used natural medium without the use of any costly chemicals. Here we used coconut water, that is two percent coconut water. With by using only coconut water, we can produce cellulose enzyme significant amount. Next slide. Next is. Cellulose. I previously already told that cellulose is mainly composed of endo, exo, and beta glucosidase. So, for proper enzymatic hydrolysis and to get maximum reducing sugar yield, there needs proper blending of endo, exo, and beta glucosidase. So, in this work, we blended all the three activities and we achieve maximum reducing sugar. That is 464 mg. Per gram dry substrate within 48 hour of incubation time and at 20 percent solid loading. Next slide. So till now the major findings here at Vanastali Vidya Pit is we produce cellulose enzyme by using natural medium, and we achieve 2.85 fu cellulose activity within three days of incubation and at submerged fermentation. Second is development of microwave assisted dilute alkaline free treatment already achieved. Next is development of fed batch enzymatic hydrolysis using mixer of cellulose enzyme. Fourth is we isolated one pentose fermenting strain which can ferment 70% uh, of pentose sugar and uh, at 8% xylose concentration as well as that same strain can also ferment hexo sugar also i have not mentioned here the data about hexo sugar so the same strain can be useful for pentose and hexo fermentation next slide please so if you go for only bioethanol that will not cost effective so we need to go for some other alternate other also valuable product such as not only bioethanol some different chemical production that is uh, by bio refinery concept bio refinery is a facility that integrate bio mass conversion process to produce fuel power and chemicals from the biomass so we have to integrate the whole process into a bio refinery concept so that we can get some profit from this 
product next slide so there are several reports on pilot scale study of lignocellulosic bioethanol production in this study 100 liter or uh, bio 100 liter bioethanol production was carried out by using wheat straw as substrate they produced this 100 liter bioethanol by using 35% biomass loading next slide in this paper author used 250 kg biomass per day capacity by using dilute acid free treated biomass they achieved this at high solid loading more than 25% biomass next slide now coming to bioenergy in india policy achievement and prospective bio diesel production is a, a, a production to be encouraged from non edible oil seed in waste degraded marginal land an integrative target of 25 20% uh, percent blending of biofuel in diesel and ethanol by 2017 minimum support price to be announced announced for farmer producing non edible seeds next several indian government agencies working on bioenergy such as dbt mnri there are several dst also next several uh, industries also working uh, previous h hindustan petroleum iocl praj industry bharat petroleum reliance industries etc next uh, several uh, there this is the several uh, industries status worldwide Canergy uh, uh, LLC USA they develop a novel thermochemical pretreatment process, which is used uh, novel high, high performance enzyme. Next is Avengoa Bioenergy. They also isolated one thermotolerant yeast, which can ferment both pentose and hexose sugar. Next, uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh -huh. Next is future biomass policy and program. short term prol policy should be enhance utilization of broad residue and wood waste next is subsidy to biomass technology to uh, okay medium term is r&d of conversion technology biomass plantation scale economy based technology institutional development etc next the conclusion is there are numerous example which clearly indicate that agricultural by product can be converted into useful product and at time main product adding to income generating employment and reducing negative impact on the environment in view of the national concern to revenge infiltration of pollutants in the environment there is need to develop indigenous cheaper substitute uh, there is uh, cheaper substitute for source of energy fertilizer for several products and for diversifying next slide next slide recycling and reuse of the so called agricultural waste will reduce the our dependency on natural uh, reduce pressure on our natural resources generate employment enhance sources of income and also increase the return of investment investment on research and development next slide next slide these are the several books in this area i published previously okay thank you thank you so much sir this is such an erudite session for all of us um now as this is our interacting session and we have received number of questions from our participants so uh, shall i start sir with the question yes questions? yes ma'am yes ma'am okay so the first question is from dr prasanta dev that whether use of multiple stains of microorganisms interfere with their growth process in the culture medium yeah yeah that can, that can also interfere but there are a report that saccharomyces cerevisiae and pcs tpts if you go for co culture by using particular saccharomyces cerevisiae and pcs tpts both will not hamper each other and both will produce maximum ethanol from hexose and pentose sugar okay so the second question is uh, can you provide your views on food versus fuel competition when utilizing agriculture crops for biofuel or bioethanol production 
yeah if you go for food to ethanol production the step is very easy only you have to go for hydrolysis but if you go for uh, lignocellulose biomass to bioethanol there are three major steps are there so it is of course complex process but if you go for food waste food to bioethanol that will surely debate will come fuel versus food so we must have to go for bi biomass to lignocellulose biomass to bioethanol production okay uh the next question is what kind of pre treatments provided there are several type of utilizing it for bioethanol uh, yeah hello yes yes ma'am there are several type of pre treatment are available but nowadays the most promising pre treatment technology is one is enzymatic pre treatment that one is second is by thermochemical pre treatment might be dilute alkaline or microwave assisted pre treatment okay uh another question is sir what is the use of spent wash or liquid after ethanol production yes same thing that can be recycled for next cycle of ethanol production okay um and how economic is the process is including yes if you the pre treatment with the pre treatment cost if you go for if you go for yeah only pre treatment if you go for hot water pre treatment of definitely it will give you the cost benefit because there is no requirement of costly uh, chemicals and also special type of reactor only you have to need water that to not distill water tap water is useful for hot water pre treatment so hot water pre treatment can be beneficial for cost effective pre treatment purpose okay sir hmm. so uh thank you so much sir thank you for your yes, valuable words yes ma'am thank you ma'am thank you hello sir hello everyone we are just waiting for our last speaker of this session she will be here any time soon hello my question to arindam sir yes sir okay uh, it is actually from participant uh, mr dr sachanta dev hmm asking whether use of multiple strains of microorganism interfere their growth process in such a medium yeah uh, for ethanol fermentation you are asking yes yes sir yeah uh, for ethanol fermentation there are report is there if you use co culture of saccharomyces cerevisiae and pcr stipitis there will not uh, they will not hamper each other growth so saccharomyces cerevisiae and pcr stipitis both can be used can be used together they will not grow the inhibition so they can use can be useful for maximum ethanol fermentation ethanol production thank you okay. one more question yes uh, about uh, extraction of bioethanol hmm. so how bioethanol can be purified after extracting some agriculture biomass or residues yeah you go for distillation normal distillation process uh by using you can go, uh, by normal distillation process you can go uh, you can get up to 95% pure ethanol 95% concentrated ethanol okay and how much uh, yield has been achieved uh, recorded or reported uh, yeah actually uh, now maximum yield you can get by present technology from 1 kg of dry biomass you can get 300 g of ethanol Okay, sir. One more question we have received that according to you, which one is more sustainable, biodiesel or bioethanol? Uh, I think bioethanol. Okay. I think uh, uh, we are done with the questions now, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So now.
Okay, sir, are you there? Arindam, sir. Hello. Okay, I think he lost the connection. No worries. We we are just waiting for our last speaker. She will be here soon. She has some uh, connection problem. That's we are just waiting for her. So. I request all the participants to please be patient and wait for our last speaker. Yes, uh, just I want to conclude uh, our previous uh, session. Dr. Banerjee, uh, he did a talk on algal binary refinery and how it can be useful for real field application. Further, uh, Dr. Anil Vandan uh, uh, told about this bi-regional application for uh, how much uh, can be extracted and how it is purified and how this uh, application can be forwarded towards bioeconomy approaches. So we are waiting for our uh, next speaker, Dr. Mona. So he's going to join us soon. Okay, so let's introduce our speaker uh, because it's been an honor that we are we have such an eminent scientist among us because uh, she has achieved so much in her career that uh, it's been an honor for uh, all of us to 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 you know to heard some valuable words from her side. So Professor Mona Ibrahim is dean of Energy Resources, Environmental Chemical and Petrochemical Engineering in the School for ISEP, Japan University of Science and Technology. She also served as Acting Vice President for Education and Academic Affairs in Egypt. Professor Ibrahim represented Egyptian NGOs in many African countries as a steering committee member for Nile Basin initiative focusing on confidence building and stakeholder involvement project funded by World Bank and was honored with the shield of Euro-Arab Cooperation Center for her prominent role in saving the environment. She also remained under secretary for Ministry of Environment in Egypt. She has active collaborations with world's well-reputed international organizations like GEF, World Bank, CIDER, Zika, and UNEP in many projects. She has over 25 years of experience and has published many publications and guided many students in various fields of environmental research. So, I think she has joined. Yes. I think Mama has joined. Uh, uh, Co host now. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Now we can hear you. Okay. Welcome you, ma'am, for this EFGP and the workshop. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> it's been an honor to have you here, ma'am. And we are looking forward for your talk for your valuable words. Over to you, ma'am. Oh, uh, uh, at what time exactly my uh, my talk? Uh, I think and... after uh, half an hour or more. Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, I'm asking about my talk. At what time exactly? It, it started at 3.30, ma'am, according to Indian Standard Time. Yes, so after uh, 30 minutes or more? No, 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 you have to start it. I start right now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. I want to share uh, first the... Uh... Yes, ma'am. 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 Y
Yes, you have to share your PPTs. Usually I'm uh, using a blackboard. So this is a uh, screen. So uh, I can send you the presentation to upload it, or uh, uh, you can you can share your screen, ma'am. There is an option share screen. You can click yeah. that. Yes, I'm um, uh, opening. Uh, then yes, files. Yes, ma'am. Then files. Okay, uh, my file on the uh, desktop, but. Uh, okay, so you have to first open up your file. You can open up your file wherever it is, wherever you have saved it. This the the desktop is not one of the options. Okay, so uh, I think wherever you have saved your presentation, uh, you have to open it up first. Okay. Yeah, and. Uh, then you have to double click on the screen share option. Are you able to find it, ma'am? Yes, it is open now, the uh, presentation. Okay, then um, please go to the option of share screen. bottom of the screen you'll find one error of the share screen you have to click that in the bottom of you'll find it in the bottom at the bottom screen of yours share screen Is it shared now? Uh, no, ma'am. We cannot be able to see your uh, PPTs. Uh, ma'am, you have to go to the Zoom where where you have where you can see your uh, all these uh, options like uh, mute, start video, security, all these options. Yes, yes. There, there's one other option is share screen. You have to click that. Yes. I'm clicking. Okay, then you can able to see your number of options and in one option you can see there is uh, uh, your PPT is also there. Or you can you can you can send your PPT to us. We'll share it from our side. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, ma'am is sending her PPT. Let me allow her to introduce again. Uh, 
some technical glitches that uh, I think she lost her contact with us. I think all the participants must have enjoyed our sessions so far. If, uh, I think Dr. Professor has rejoined again. Do you receive it? I sent it already. Okay, we are checking it, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am, we received your PPT. Uh, just give us some time to share it. Okay. Meanwhile, we get your PPT, ma'am. Let me allow to introduce you again because yeah, it's okay. been an honor to have you here. So uh, let our participants know more about you. Uh, you are Professor Mona G. Ibrahim. Um, you acting as the Dean of Energy Resources, Environmental Chemical and Petrochemical Engineering in the School of for Egypt, Japan University of Science and Technology. She also, you also served as acting vice president for education and academic affairs in Egypt since 2016 to 2018. You also represented in Egyptian NGOs in many African countries as a steering committee member for Nile Basin Initiative, focusing on confidence building and stakeholder involvement project funded by World Bank and was honored with the shield of Euro-Arab Cooperation Center for her prominent role in saving the environment. You also remain under Secretary for Ministry of Environment in, from 2007 to 2012 in Egypt. You also has an active collaborations with world's well-reputed international organizations like GEF, World Bank, CDL, GICA, and UNEP in many projects. You have more than 25 years of experience and has published many publications and guided many students in various fields of environmental research. Thank you so much, ma'am to be here to enlighten our knowledge. Over to you, ma'am, PPTs. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction and for the uh, invitation for such important workshop. Thank you, ma'am, over to you. Uh, I hope you can see your uh, PPTs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and you will scroll down with me or? Uh, you, you just tell us to scroll down, ma'am. We'll do it from here. It is not scrolled from my side. Oh, it's okay. Um, okay. No, ma'am, as we have, uh, we are sharing this screen. So okay. we have the access only. So you can tell us whenever you need it to scroll down. We will do it from our side. Okay. So uh, please return back to the first slide. Thank you. 
so today, today I will uh, talk with you about life cycle assessment of uh, waste to energy systems. Next, please. Okay. Uh, in my talk today, uh, I will include uh, uh, a definition about life cycle assessment, phases of life cycle assessment, uh, all my presentation in a very uh, simple way, uh, the benefits of life cycle assessment, uh, definition of waste in general, and the uh, negative impact of waste on environment. Then from waste to energy, waste to energy technologies in a brief also, and then benefits of, uh, and then how to apply the uh, four phases of life cycle assessment in waste to energy systems. Next, please. So life cycle assessment uh, is a methodology for assessing environmental impacts associated with all the stages of the life cycle of a commercial product, process, or service. For instance, in the case of a manufactured product, environmental impacts are assessed from raw material extraction and the processing through the product's manufacture, distribution, and use to the recycling or the final disposal of the materials uh, composing it. Life cycle assessment is used to support decisions and policies along the production supply chain chains. It is a standardized method, ISO 14,040 and ISO 14,044 defined in four phases. Phase number one, goal and scope definition. Second phase, life cycle inventory, then life cycle impact assessment, and the fourth and final phase is the interpretation. Next, please. Now, this is the, to simplify the four phases of life cycle assessment. Goal and the scope, life cycle inventory, impact assessment, and interpretation. Next, please. For the first phase, goal and the scoping, the application and type of life cycle assessment in this phase described. The production systems to be evaluated are defined and the geographical and temporal scope are defined as well. This step also includes the definition of the functional unit which will act as the reference for the subsequent steps. Next, please. Second phase, the inventory analysis. In the second step of the process includes considering all environmental inputs as well as uh, outputs that are highly connected and associated with the service or product that we use for. We are talking about the consumption of energy and raw materials that you need for the production process, as well as the waste streams and the emissions of pollutants. Through this particular step, the inventory analysis step, you will get a comprehensive picture of what happens to your product and how it affects the environment. Next, please. In the uh, third phase of life cycle assessment, the impact assessment, during this stage of life cycle assessment, it is essential to create conclusions that will help you to understand the decisions that are affecting your business. Therefore, you will start to classify how the process affects the environment, then to evaluate everything based on importance. At the same time, you need to translate everything you notice and create a comprehensive evaluation that will help you to understand what is essential for the, for the, the work you work on. Finally, you can translate everything 
into global warming and environmental themes that are generally important for humanity. Next, please. The fourth and the final phase of life cycle assessment is the interpretation. Finally, the interpretation phase will provide you the conclusions that you got throughout the process, which are entirely affected by scope and goals that you defined in the first part of the process. Keep in mind that if you wish to comply ISO 14044 standards, make sure that your conclusions are valid and supported by the data used throughout the procedure. Only after doing that, you will be able to share your results and improvement decisions with the world. You can find numerous available life cycle assessment software on the markets upon your preference and the industry niche. Uh, next, please. So uh, the benefits of life cycle assessment, uh, this approach enables product designers, service providers, uh, governmental agents, and individuals to make long-term choices considering all the environmental medium, air, water, and land. Uh, life cycle approaches avoid shifting problems from one life cycle stage to another, one geographic area to another, and one environmental medium, for example, air quality to another, for example, water or land. Next, please. There is some uh, also benefits for industry by integrating the life cycle perspective in overall management and bringing product and process development in a more sustainable direction. The organization can harvest the benefits of environmental, occupational health and safety, risk and the quality management as well as developing and applying cleaner process and product options. Incorporating life cycle and sustainable management will improve image and the brand value for both world market players as well as smaller suppliers and producers. Next, please. For governments, initiatives will not only secure and strengthen the position of the industrial and service sector, in the regional and global markets, but also ensure overall environmental benefits to society balanced with economic and social aspects by engaging in supportive programs and initiatives and implementing life cycle approaches. Governments can show global responsibility and governance by sharing and disseminating sustainability options worldwide. Next, please. For consumers, life cycle approaches will help point consumption in a more sustainable direction by offering better information for purchasing, transport systems, energy sources to guide consumers. It offers a platform for multi-stakeholders dialogue and public involvement with industries and governments, going from local agenda to national and international strategies for sustainable development. Next, please. Okay. Uh, waste uh, defined as unwanted or unusable materials. Waste is any substance which is discarded after primary use or is worthless, defective, and of no use. Next, please. Uh, the waste can be found in the forms of liquid, gas, and solid. There are many waste types defined by modern systems of waste management, such as municipal waste, which includes household waste, commercial waste, and demolition waste. Hazardous waste includes some industrial waste, biomedical waste, which includes clinical waste, and special hazard waste, which includes radioactive waste, explosive waste, and electronic waste. Next, please. So there is many uh, negative impacts of waste on environment. For soil contamination, 
is the first main problem caused by improper waste removal and disposal. Some waste that end up in landfills excrete hazardous chemicals that leak into the soil. When the plastic bottles eventually break down, they release diethyl hexyl adipate, a carcinogen that affects our reproduction systems, causing liver dysfunction and weight loss. Soil contamination does not only affect plant growth, but it is also unhealthy to humans and animals feeding on those plants. It is therefore important that every household must pay attention to recycling. Plastic materials, paper, and electronic waste can be recycled at your local recycling centers if everyone takes time to segregate and sort their recyclable waste and bring them to recycling centers the bulk of waste will be removed from the landfills. Next, please. Uh, second, in the air contamination, waste that contains hazardous chemicals such as bleach and acids needs to be disposed of properly and only in approved containers with correct labels. Some paper and plastic are burnt in landfills, emitting gas and chemicals that hurt the ozone layer Waste that releases dioxins are also dangerous and pose our health, especially when they diffuse into the air that we breathe, in addition to the methane gas decomposing waste. Finally, landfill gas produced by the decomposing waste can be explosive and can harm the nearby communities. Next, please. Water contamination. Uh, hazardous waste in the environment leach into the ground and ultimately into groundwater. This water is used for many things, starting from watering the local fields to drinking purposes. Toxic liquid chemicals from waste can also seep into water streams and the bodies of water. Untreated sewage can threaten marine life that contact the contaminated water. It can destroy and suffocate marine habitats such as corals, contaminated water is also dangerous and harmful to humans who consume fish and other marine life. Next, please. Fourth, uh, about bad Im impact on human health. Improper disposal of waste can greatly affect the health of the population living nearby the polluted area or landfills. Waste disposal workers and other employees in these landfill facilities are at a, a great risk. Exposure to the improperly handled waste can cause skin irritation, blood infection, respiratory problems, growth problems, and even reproductive issues. Next, please. Impact on animals and marine life, it cannot be stressed enough. Our carelessness while dealing with our waste and garbage affects us. Animals likewise suffer from the effects of pollution caused by improperly disposed waste and rubbish. Styrofoam and cigarette butts have been known to cause this in marine animals who consume them. Other animals who consume grasses near contaminated areas or landfills are also at risk of being poisoned due to the toxins that seep into the soil. Next, please. Uh, impact of waste as a disease carrying pests, mosquitoes and rats are known to live and breed in sewage areas, and both are known to carry life threatening diseases. Mosquitoes breed in both cans and collecting water tires can carry diseases such as malaria and dingo. Rats find food and shelter in landfills and sewage. They can carry diseases such as leptopyrosis and salmonellosis. Moreover, moisture uh, production from waste is a breeding ground for mold. They are bacteria that have the ability to spread and to grow according to the appropriate conditions, such as moisture production from appliances and food scraps. Next, please. Uh, waste has adversely affected the local economy. Everyone wants to stay and live in a healthy, clean, fresh, and sanitized place. 
A city with poor waste management will not certainly attract tourists or investors. Landfill facilities that are mismanaged can cause the local economy to sink, which can then affect the livelihood of the locals. Next, please. Also, the local economy, everyone wants um, the uh, missed recycling uh, opportunities. There is revenue in recycling cities that do not implement the proper removal. And recycling of waste miss on this. They also miss out on the resources that can be reused and on the employment opportunities that a recycling center brings. Next, please. For the climate change, decomposing waste emits gases that rise to the atmosphere and trap heat. Greenhouse gases are one of the major culprits are behind the extreme weather changes that the world is experiencing from extremely strong storms and by whom's to southern heat, people are experiencing and suffering the negative effects of greenhouse gases and uh, climate action is the um, one of uh, the uh, sustainable, the 17 sustainable goals, the goal uh, number 13, and all our academia yani, should take into consideration these 17 uh, sustainable development goals up to 2030 to work on and to improve as much as we can. Next, please. So uh, after we talk about the life cycle assessment and phases, then the waste and its negative impact on the environment generally. So we will talk now about waste to energy to save environment from the negative impact of this waste and at the same time to benefit from this waste to uh, produce energy. Waste to energy is the process of generating energy in the form of electricity and or heat from the primary treatment of waste or the processing of waste into a fuel source. Waste to energy is a form of energy recovery. Most waste to energy processes generate electricity and or heat directly through combustion or produce a combustible fuel uh, commodities such as methane, methanol, ethanol, or synthetic fuels. During the last decades, focus has shifted from the final disposal towards developing a circular economy focusing on resources and energy recovery. Waste to energy becomes a key part of modern waste management and can reduce the dependency on fossil fuels. Also, landfills equipped with landfill gas collection can recover energy and produce heat and power. Next, please. So what is the main ways to energy technologies? First, the anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic digestion is applicable to biogenic and easily biodegradable residual materials. As a consequence, lignin is not considered anaerobic digestion, while cellulose and hemicellulose are degraded slowly in comparison. During anaerobic digestion, the input substrate is transformed by different groups of microorganisms into biogas, which mainly consist of methane and carbon dioxide. The substrate undergoes four consecutive conversion steps, hydrolysis, acidogenesis, acetogenesis and methanogenesis. Next, please. Anaerobic digestion is realized in fermentation tanks with the exclusion of oxygen. Re uh, respective technologies can be roughly classified by operation temperature, mesovelic or thermophilic, dry matter content, wet or dry fermentation, and process segmentation one or multi-stages. Hereby, pretreatment of the substrate promotes effective, di effective digestion and may include shredding, uh, homogenization, purification, or supply of nutrients. Within this technology, energy is yielded by utilizing methane. 
It is either used in a cycle process or to produce heat and electricity, combusted directly to provide heat only or in upgraded to for biofuel. The co-product uh, digestate may be used for soil amendment, considering, of course, the legal regulations in this regard. Next, please. Second technology is the hydrothermal carbonization. In this process of hydrothermal carbonization is applicable to biogenic material and is performed by means of hot pressurized water. Prior to the uh, hydrothermal carbonization process, the water content of the substrate is adjusted. Impurities are removed, the substrate is mixed and shredded, and additives may be added for process enhancement. Substrate conversion towards a carbon-rich product, referred to as biochar, is provoked by moderate temperature from 180 to 250, and moderate a pressure from 1.2 to 2.5. Uh, the carbonization process, hydrothermal carbonization, may take from 2 to 16 hours, and a liquid uh, aqueous phase must be presented at all times. The warranty suspension existing the reactor is cooled and consequently uh, dewatered. Next, please. As hydro quality uh, of the substrate is developed during a hydrothermal carbonization, high dry material contents are achieved for the solid phase to generate thermal and electrical energy. Dewatered and dried hydrochar is used to fuel a cycle process. Combustion in a boiler to produce heat only is an alternative option. Uh, processing water is a byproduct of the uh, hydrothermal carbonization process. Depending on the substrate, it may show high contamination, but also high nutrient levels. Nutrient recovery and simultaneous process of water cleaning often entails a complex treatment uh, preferred. Next, please. Third uh, waste to energy technology is the pyrolysis. Pyrolysis done in the absence uh, of oxygen and through the application of medium to high temperature, temperature from 200 to 1,100, a pyrolytic decomposition of solid waste is induced. Uh, Pre-treatment may include drying, shredding, and the addition of lime to the substrate for emission control. The products of the pyrolysis process contain a carbonized solid part and a gaseous part. Quenching of the gaseous phase may result in the condensing of long chain uh, uh, products, pyrolytic oils and tars. The distribution of the uh, pyrolytic products is in large parts depending on the temperature and retention time applied. Next, please. Slow pyrolysis, long retention time, and low temperature leads to a high share in char and gas, while fast pyrolysis, very short retention time, and medium temperature results in a share in oil of up to 75%. Uh, reactor types can be differentiated by the mode of heat input, direct or indirect heating, and heat supply uh, allothermal, autothermal. Pyrolysis products can be combusted in a cycle process or a boiler to produce either heat and power or heat only. Uh, especially the pyrolysis of waste streams leads to the accumulation of heavy metals in the solid phase and pyrolysis char has to be disposed of in this case. Next, please. Force uh, waste to energy uh, technology is the gasification. Solid and the dry waste is required for gasification in the three different kinds of reactor designs are distinguished, fixed bed, fluidized bed, and entrained flow reactors. The classification is based upon the fluid dynamics of the substrate in the reactor. 
Additional distinctive features are applied pressure in the reactor, the number of stages, and the mode of heat supply. Shredding and drying is an emittent part of the pretreatment procedures for most of input feed stocks. Next, please. In the gasification reactor, the substrate first goes through uh, biolytic com uh, combust uh, composition, and the biolytic gases react subsequently with the gasification agent. A, a complete transition for, from the carbon in the biomass to the product gas is aimed for. Various gasification agents are EBW, uh, H2O, H2O plus O2, or air, and will greatly impact the properties of the product gas. The most prominent components of the product gas include carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and carbon monoxide. Uh, the production of gas is thereby accompanied by tar and coke. Next, please. Uh, last waste to energy technology is the incineration, which holds the lowest demand of substrates as any uh, burnable waste is eligible for combustion. High moisture contents, however, diminish its efficiency due to a high energy input for the evaporation of, waste, of water. Low calorific waste, uh, which is high in moisture, may therefore require additional uh, support fuel. Within the incineration process, uh, preheating and uh, pyrolytic decomposition is followed by gasification and subsequent uh, exothermic oxidation of the released gas. Combustion temperatures are usually held below uh, 1,150 degrees to reduce high temperature corrosion. Next, please. Uh, next to great furnaces, fluidized bed boilers and rotary uh, kilns have uh, emerged as the uh, leading technologies in the field of waste incineration. Depending on the legalization, strength flow gas uh, uh, cleaning is mandatory. A generated heat can be used directly for heat supply or indirectly, uh, indirectly within a cycle process for the supply of electricity and heat. Next, please. So here's some uh, of the benefits of energy uh, from waste or waste to energy process. Uh, reduction of waste going to landfill sites, reduction of carbon emissions, reduction of the use of fossil fuels. Electricity and heat can be generated from waste which provide an alternative and more uh, environment friendly source of energy. Uh, and last but not least, the local community around uh, energy from waste facilities benefits from the creation of jobs to cost effective energy. Next, please. So, uh, after I uh, uh, present to you the definition and the stages of life cycle assessment, then the definition of waste and its negative impact on environment. And then um, the technologies of uh, waste to energy to benefit from waste. Then it is important to apply life cycle assessments in waste to energy systems. As previously mentioned, the step of life cycle assessment should be applied to waste to energy system to investigate the environmental impacts of these systems. For example, our recent uh, study shared uh, from my science and uh, Dr. Ablihasha uh, Maturaya about life cycle assessment of waste to energy from uh, uh, trickling bioelectrochemical reactor. Uh, yani I, I will mention um, a summary uh, about uh, this work as an application of life cycle assessment 
on waste uh, to energy system. So for all human settlements, whether in rural or urban areas, waste treatment is a problem. Conventional waste treatment process, which are developed over a century ago, activated sludge, as you know, treating filters and lagoons, are not efficient enough to meet present day wastewater challenges and are an economic burden to industries and the public. Next, please. Moreover, the organic matter of wastewater uh, retains high energy value, especially industrial, domestic, and agricultural wastewater with high organic matter. The energy content of domestic wastewater is estimated to be 9.3 times higher than the treatment expense and could be a decent source of energy. Due to the high cost of operation and the energy demand alternatives, approaches for the treatment of wastewater are highly uh, desired and uh, being developed across the globe, a significantly unique methodology which is being sought after is based on the bioelectrochemical conversion of waste. Uh, Bioelectrochemical uh, systems system became a technology of curiosity in the last 15 years, representing a green energy solution that is capable of recovering electricity fuels and commodities from the uh, chemical energy available in organic molecules. Next, please. So to apply the life cycle impact assessment on uh, this uh, uh, bioelectrochemical reactor, the uh, main goal of, the, of this life cycle assessment identified to assess from cradle to grave environmental impact associated with the construction and operation based on the scenarios of uh, trickling uh, bioelectrochemical reactor. All system inputs are related to energy consumption, fuel, electrical power, and natural resources. The system output includes emissions and the generation of waste hazardous and non-hazardous from the process, uh, processes extraction, transport, and production. The end of life and the impact of the treated uh, water transported were not included in the uh, scope of this study Next, please. For the, in the second uh, phase, the inventory, the parameters used to describe the environmental burdens of the process are divided into inputs and outputs. Inputs include materials, uh, products, chemical substance, and preparations, fuels, resources, uh, as raw material uh, or energy, and electricity. The outputs includes materials, products, energy, air emissions, waste water emissions, and waste. The process inputs and outputs had been uh, modeled uh, with the SEMA uh, uh, Pro software application, following the uh, guidelines set out in the ISO 14,040 and ISO uh, 21,930 standards. Next, please. For the impact assessment, environmental indicators are obtained for the impact, uh, impact categories together with the indicator that uh, quantifies them. Next, please. For the interpretation phase, the results show that several variables, including production of raw materials, system operation, and the end of life phases have relatively large impacts in some categories. The results also ensured that manufacturing phase is the most affected phase. It showed that the respiratory in inorganics and the global warming are the main damaged categories. The profile of 16 uh, respiratory inorganics contributions seems to be the main due to the emissions of nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide from the manufacturing of plastic, uh, plastic pipelines and Portland cement. Next, please. Mm -hmm. 
The category non-carcinogens is uh, predominant by manufacturing of steel that emits uh, dioxins and arsenic during the manufacturing of steel mesh and sieves. In the category global warming, the main contribution comes from the manufacturing phase, namely the carbon dioxide in the stage of plastic pipeline. Transport and the clay mine processes are less relevant. Next, please. To summarize uh, our study, this life cycle assessment study reports inventory data and impact assessment associated with the manufacturer and operational phases of uh, trickling uh, bioelectrochemical uh, reactor from cradle to grave. Many of the impacts are associated to the air emissions in the manufacturing stage. Changing the material of plastic ball in the reactor is one possibly to reduce the environmental impacts and improve the sustainability of the reactor. The reactor can be attractive substitute for conventional wastewater treatment reactors. Uh, the reactor uses, please, the previous one. Uh, wastewater as a feed stock and converts wastewater through electrochemical method into a low grade fertilizer to produce electricity. Total daily production of the electricity is assumed to be 0.2 kilowatt hour in case of domestic uh, wastewater. Next, please. And this is the references of uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you thank so you. much, ma'am. Thank you for this valuable knowledge you provided us. Uh, well, uh, we have received so many questions from our participants as this is the interactive session. So shall I start with the questions? Uh, please. Okay, so the first questions we uh, receive is, what have been the applications of LCA to solid waste management? Yeah, LCA, uh, we use LCA in, as I mentioned before, for any product or any service. So for the uh, solid waste management includes uh, many stages uh, from collection to transportation, uh, uh, then uh, uh, collection, uh, transportation, and handling up to the final landfill and the, uh, the uh, final proposal in the landfill. So uh, uh, through uh, life cycle assessment of this whole process of solid waste management, we will discover uh, the, uh, the these points which should be uh, improved. Uh, for example, for the transportation, uh, we, we can find that we have to use another route which uh, less in the test in the distance, in this case, the energy will be reduced and the uh, release of emissions will be reduced. So again, life cycle assessment should be used in everything to find the way to improve the process or the management system or the service. I hope that is uh, clear. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the second question and the last question of today's session is, what type of software can be used in LCA and how it can be analyzed technically? As I mentioned, there is uh, many software uh, we can apply to, uh, to get the life cycle assessments of any product and uh, it is depends on uh, your experience yeah, any someone experience or the uh, 
the the um, the the process uh, itself. So according to the process and the experience of the uh, of the academia, um, select the proper software to apply. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I welcome our dean, sir, Dr. Edges Gaur, sir, to pay vote of thanks to Professor, ma'am. Uh, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Gaur, sir. Gaur, sir. Uh, sir, can you? Okay, I think it's, it's completely, you know, this internet connection, sometimes it's really a problem for all of us. I think sir is not able to join us right now. So on behalf of uh, entire committee organizing team and, uh, and from the side of our team, sir, uh, we are happy to express the vote of thanks to you, ma'am, for your esteemed talk for the EFDPCOM workshop on ways to bioenergy. Your talk really motivated all the participants and us to work with more enthusiasm and passion to achieve bigger results. And we would love to host you again in the future and hopefully we'll see you next time in an offline mode. Hope Thank you, you so time. much. And I want to encourage all uh, yani the junior colleagues to work on um, on this waste to energy and life uh, to apply life cycle assessment it is a, a promising uh, track of research yes ma'am uh, ma'am just wait for a while i think uh, sir is there so I, I just, I really like you to just wait for a couple of minutes. We are just doing some, you know, we are me, uh, unmuting him. It's really been an honor to have you here, ma'am. It was really an inter it was really a knowledgeable session and hopefully uh, we all work in, in, in such an enthusiasm manner and we'll learn something from your presentation and your from your work. How many attendees uh, how many attendees with, with us today in the session? Uh, uh, About... yes, ma it's, it's around 200 ma'am. 200? Yes ma'am. Okay. Uh, I, I want to thank you for the very well uh, organization of the workshop. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's, it's completely a teamwork. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I know, of course. But now you are representing them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Please convey to all of them uh, my many thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am, and all your blessings. Yes, I see uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Gower. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma I welcome you, sir. So please pay my <laughs> thanks to Professor. Hi, Mona. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Gower. I'm, I'm really glad to see you here. Me too. Me too. <laughs> How is, you, is your wife? <laughs> I'm wonderful. She's also fine. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, it has been a wonderful talk, in fact, and... Uh, I'm so delighted uh, you could uh, give it. And, uh, and certainly I've been all through your talk, I've been listening. No, uh, it, which, it, uh, it becomes a real collaboration between the Indo, uh, uh, yeah. with your uh, country, Indo-Egyptian and uh, maybe Japan also in between with your institution. It, yeah, I look forward yeah, to your collaboration. And this kind of work will be benefiting not only both the countries, but the world as, as such. And I'm, yes. I, I, I'm really glad that you are doing such a wonderful work and such a wonderful talk you gave. Thank we could you. Not, so... uh, we could not go to Nigeria this time, as you know. Uh, but maybe we meet sometime in future. 
I will try to invite you to India anytime in future. Right? Yes. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure to to share in the workshop in such an yeah. important workshop, yeah. uh, and hope to for uh, more collaboration yeah, between sure. your institution and ours, uh, and maybe to see you soon in Egypt in Alexandria. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Not in, in Nigeria this time. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye thank bye. you so much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. to your husband and children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye bye. Now we are. Can I leave now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Please. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much for your presence, ma'am. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, so I request all the participants that we are uh, end up with our session, today's session, and we'll resume tomorrow at the same time of 10.30. Thank you everyone for your presence.